What do you think FreeCAD looks like a decade from now? <laughs> you mean if the if the robots don't kill us all, if the AI doesn't take over? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Assuming the heat death of the universe has been avoided. And the AI <laughs> has left us some work to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Open Hardware Manufacturing Podcast, the podcast about making open source hardware. My name is Stephen Haas. And I'm Lucian Chapar. And today we have a super cool guest on. Today we have Brad Collette. And Brad is the founder and CTO of Onsol, an open core company working to improve FreeCAD. Onsol is also building features on top of FreeCAD that are aimed specifically at commercial applications and a bunch of other stuff. Brad, thank you so much for coming on Ohm. It's really good to have you. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. This is a super good chat. We got into a bunch of stuff talking about open core as a thing and raising money and like your background, having a ton of experience in FreeCAD to start and then shifting into a company. We get into how the interests of a company align with an open source project and how some of the features for commercial applications can kind of trickle down to the home gamer, the hobbyist user of a software and everyone can ultimately benefit from that. We talk about the topological naming problem and like open cascade and the thorny core that that is. Yeah, we also get into like, what does the future of FreeCAD look like? How does Brad envision it shaping over the next 10 years? And how FreeCAD has been instrumental for Opula's distribution and sharing and collaboration for open hardware and how we can view FreeCAD along with a whole bunch of other open source projects, helping facilitate really ease of sharing open hardware projects in the future. And then finally, we touch on how you, the listener, can do your part to help FreeCAD. Yeah, this was a really good chat, Brad. It was really good having you on. We're really stoked about what you're doing to help make FreeCAD better. It's This is a good one. This is very cool. I really enjoy it. Cool. All right. All right, let's get into it. All right, Brad, who are you and what is your background? What's your jam? I'm Brad Collette. I'm a developer on FreeCAD now. I've been developing all my life software in one form or another and somehow ended up in this project. Now I'm the CTO of Ansel and building commercially around FreeCAD. That's one big run-on sentence. Th that's perfect, though. That's great. That's great. <laughs> Most of the time, that will result in a run-on sentence, but that's exactly what I'm looking for. So looking at the stuff that you have done, there is so much tied to FreeCAD. You've literally written two books about FreeCAD. Uh -huh. So how do you get started in FreeCAD? Because so much of what you do is tied around this piece of software. How do you get introduced to it? Why did it grab you? Like, what was the initial pull to, to FreeCAD? I... It fell out of, I mean, I fell into open source software uh, a long time ago. And I was developing commercially. I uh, worked with Dell for a lot of years. And, and you know, I was a Microsoft fanboy. And this was the way you develop software. And then I started mucking around with open source. And it's like, this is a better way to develop software. It isn't necessarily a faster way. But in the end, the software itself is better. Yeah. And so that kind of... Along the way, I, I got into the, the maker movement. I started building CNC machines. There was no open source CAM solution at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I, we started playing around with that. We were contributing. I say we, it was myself and a, I ended up getting into the, the machining community. And I don't know any of this stuff, right? I mean, <laughs> I, I'm mostly a self-taught programmer. Yeah, I'm not a machinist, <laughs> but you know, I, I started learning from people. That's what I like about programming was you get to learn all sorts of stuff. Sure. And I fell into this, the maker community and these people were teaching me about machining and teaching me about, and they're like, we should do, make something, make some open source software. And so we started contributing to an older project called HeeksCAD. Uh, HeeksCAD kind of died. And along the way, we met some of the people in the FreeCAD community. And so we said, well, let's go over there, hang out with those guys and see if we can make this work. And after Fusion changed their licenses in FreeCAD, there was this huge influx of refugees into the FreeCAD project. <laughs> and a large percentage of them were coming in for CAM. So the, the Path Workbench started getting a lot of attention. And that kind of pulled me into the project leadership more. And mm -hmm. you know, I then became a maintainer. And I got into the FPA and, and one thing just after another. Sure. Okay. So it, it kind of, it, it came in because there wasn't a good solution. You had software experience and you were into the maker scene and you're like, how can mm -hmm. I, you know, how, how can I best help facilitate these two things kind of kissing? 
And right. I, I'm not surprised that you had a lot of fusion refugees because one of the best things about fusion is that it has the really good built in camp. That's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, if you lose a uh, good fusion access and it gets expensive and the Cory Doctoro and shitification of a platform that's happening with it is is happening with it, then, you know, you're going to have people that leave and look for something that still scratches that itch. So I'm not surprised you had a lot of refugees coming in from that. And, and fusion is such a beautiful user interface. Um, you know, it is it's much easier to onboard for hobbyists than some of the other commercial alternatives. And so, yeah, when they pull the the rug out from people, they came flooding in and were frustrated with FreeCAD's user interface. And so mm-hmm. it was like, you know, we're going in a direction. We might as well get used to it and start working on it. Yep. Yeah, exactly. It, this also reminds me a lot of Godot, the open source um, game engine. Just had this, I think it was in like the past six months with the whole Unity blowout where they had that insane change, proposed change to their like... Um, like their, charging per API call, I think. It, it was like charging per instance of the game that you sell or something. It was just wild. And so all these people came into Godot and I've been following the lead developer on Godot quite a bit, watching how he's been handling this huge influx. And like, it reminds me very similar. You have this big proprietary thing that people are used to, and then they get this vendor lock-in and shootification thing that happens. And then they go to that open source thing and you get these refugees coming in and helping try and make it better, give feedback. And like managing that is not a small thing at all. No, not at all. And Sometimes you just don't get a choice. Like something's going to change in the world, and it's going to affect your community or your your software. Or there's a new tech that makes its impact, and so adapt. Right? Um, you're going to make changes, and that's in my mind. That's where we're at right now. Is we're dealing with some changes in the CAD industry in general, and how you're licensing and how you're monetizing. And then you have things like you know the open hardware where people want to do more and they want to do more collaboration and they want, so, you know, the standalone desktop application, me designing on my own, isn't quite cutting it anymore. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, deal with it. Yep. (laughs) So you also mentioned FPA. So we're we're not even Mm -hmm. to Ansel yet. Like I I, want to set, set the stage for like who you are and all the multiple things that you've done involved with FreeCAD and also the books too, I want to get to, but the FPA then came to be in, was it 2018 or or it was more recently than that, right? Yeah, like 2021, I think, at right. the end of 2021. Okay, that's right. Yeah, so It's only been two or three years. Yeah, yeah, I guess so, yeah. And you were a co-founding member of the FPA, so what is it? I was, yeah. Yeah. So FPA is the FreeCAD Project Association. And what was happening was when the refugees started coming in and as the project matured, some people were saying, you know, how do we support this financially? How do we give you some money and, and so forth? Yeah. Without a legal entity, it ends up going into one developer's pocket. Yeah. And you trust them to dole it out. So we looked at, we said, well, we need something, a foundation or an organization or a 501c3, but that's a US-based thing. Mm-hmm. So we did the research to, to could, could we join it? one of the other platforms, you know, that provide an umbrella organization that supports lots of, and that didn't fit. Yeah. And so we ended up forming a, it's called an AISBL. I can't remember, but it's a French. It's a international 501c3 equivalent. Okay. Nonprofit. Yeah. It's an association. And then its relationship to FreeCAD is, it's a legal entity that holds and distributes the money. And its job is to oversee and encourage the project as a whole. But the FPA is does not deal with the code. Like we don't mandate what changes, we don't review pull requests or anything like that. Yeah. We just handle the resources. And uh, that's worked out so far to be a good model. You know, it's kind of tempting to say, well, we've got the money so we can make the decisions. And yeah, that's not what you want in an open source community. You want yep. some more of a collective decision process, yeah. as hard as that is. Mm-hmm. So that's that's what the FPA is. There's a small management team that does the day-to-day writing checks and paying bills. And then there's a larger assembly that makes the decisions as a collective on a collective vote, which you know well now. <laughs> I do now. Yes, I do know yeah. well. So like it's uh, it's really about how do we take money that people have donated to FreeCAD and best allocate it towards the project to help improve the project as a whole. That's really like the ethos right. of the thing. And you would think that's easy, but it turns out that that's a really hard thing to do. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> like figuring out where to allocate capital 
allocating capital is something companies do pretty well and something that open source projects and collectives of people really struggle with. Yeah. It's a, it's a hard thing. It is. And then when you try and make two of those things kiss and have a company, <laughs> and which we're going to get to because this is one of the things I really want to talk to you about is like the balance of those two things because it's such a hard thing. Yeah, that's tricky. So now you've you found the FPA, you co-found the FPA. And then you wrote books about getting started with it, too. I, I didn't know this until I was doing some research for this interview. That's so cool that you've literally written books about it, too. Well, I was, you know, it, that's another thing you fell into is we started playing with FreeCAD and there were no, there were no books. The documentation sucked. Yeah. And really what documentation there was was geared at developers and yeah. at, at more at power users. And then we got approached, some uh, pack publishing said, hey, would you do a book? And we like. Yeah, sure, we'll do a book. And it was a terrible book. Uh, it's still out there. You can still buy it. It's still terrible. Um, <laughs> oh, no. What's terrible I'm, about it? I, I I can't imagine it's that bad. Now, Pact, uh, as a publishing company, is actually really good to work with for a, uh, an open source project. But they have a very rigid template for what they want in a book. Oh, I see. So they want, you know, and this is sort of, wow, the, the first book came out in 2012, I think. So it's it's ancient. Okay. But they want, you know, they want to do a series. And the, and so they like, you know, it needs to be 87 pages long and it needs to have these chapters and it's really rigid yeah. and it, it's really hard to do anything in depth. So it was, it was okay, but it served its purpose. Mm -hmm. But a few years later, I wanted to do a book that was a little bit better oriented to a new user coming on and just, just how do I make a thing? Yeah. How do I design a basic shape? You know, what do I, one hour I need to do a, a technical drawing or something like, how do I do that? And so I did that book published through a, a local publishing company and it, it was, uh, just oriented at recipes that follow some very, you know, almost geared at like a really precocious teenager who's trying <laughs> to get under one of these tools and do something. So. That's a, exactly the audience to write a book for, I guess, for freak out a precocious teenager. <laughs> Hey, you know, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> I had two sons that were both kind of in the maker thing at the same time. And yeah. so I'm thinking about, yeah, how do you, you know, how do I get my kid to design stuff? So that's, that's why we did that one. That's super cool. So you've, you've had so much experience with developing FreeCAD, organizing FreeCAD, raising money for FreeCAD. We have been talking for you. I remember in like 2011 or something, uh, you reached out to me as you were like founding the FPA or something like that. And we were chatting about the FPA and like, you know, fundraising for that and stuff like that. So, and that was only a few years ago. You've been doing this for a really long time. Now there's a company. So what is Ansel? How did it start? Really? This one out of the blue. This one just came along and smacked me. There was a few of us in the pre-CAD community that for a long time were struggling with how do you make this a career? Like I'd say, I'm a developer and I want to work on FreeCAD. That's what yeah. I want to spend my career on. Mm -hmm. How do I do that? And also buy groceries. Yes. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, we've messed around with, you know, Patreons and with, oh, there's all these services that you can tip somebody and so forth. And YouTube videos. I built up a, a YouTube channel and I got to the point it was monetized. But, you know, I mean, I, I'm making 20 bucks a, a month. Yeah. All right. It's like, it's not going to look at me. It's not going to feed me. All right. <laughs> yeah. So, you, you can't <laughs> cover your mortgage monthly with the coffee donation. Yeah. Yeah. No, you can't cover your coffee bill. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, unless you really get a, a large audience and then some of those services work. So we're back and forth. And so I saw really, you know, that here's the problem I want to solve. I want to get really good developers contributing to the big problems that, that plague FreeCAD. Sure. And then I got approached by OpenCore Ventures, which is a VC firm founded by Sid Sabrandi, the uh, CEO of GitLab. Mm. And their model was, is, continues to be to try to replicate what happened with GitLab. Uh, you had a, a, an open source project and then you commercialized around it mm. and, you know, and turned it into a you know, a billion dollar company, publicly yeah. traded, very successful company. Yeah. So instead of like waiting for entrepreneurs to come and pitch an idea, what they do is they go out and they look for open source projects that have traction, that have market potential. And then they go and they create a company around it and they, they fund the company. So it, the genesis of the company is flipped. Starts with them, 
so they end up being the the, the primary investor mm-hmm. initially, and then the idea is you grow it up, and then you do the next round of funding, and it looks like any other VC project. Back thing, yeah. So yeah, that's that. That was the what, and it came like out of the blue, and and I'm like, he said, you know, do you want to do this? Do you want to go hire engineers and work on this? I'm like, <laughs> sign me up, absolutely. That's <laughs> really? exactly what I want to do. There was no hesitation. You're just like, so. yeah, I'm super in. Oh, there was a little hesitation, but. I'm condensing the 24 hours to, uh, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, this is what we want to do. We want to do this. Yeah. So did they reach out to you? Did they see like, oh, Brad's written books. He's helped found the FPA. He, you know, did the Pathwork bench and they were like, this is the guy to run the thing. And they reach out to you. Or was it a general populace of the community? Like how did, how did that pan out? No, they, they contacted me. They, they'd been following FreeCAD for a long time. Yeah. And they said, you know, Obviously, there's money here if we can figure out how to do it. Yeah. CAD is a $10 billion a year industry. Mm-hmm. It's enormous. Yeah. Right. Certainly, there's room for an open source alternative if we can figure out how to structure it. What do you monetize? How do you connect with customers? Lots and lots of problems to solve. Yeah. But they knew that there was potential there and the project had almost a 20 year history. So the, the project is stable. People are using it. So then they looked into the community and said, you know, who is. You know, has some entrepreneurial background. Who's involved in the leadership? I, I don't think that I would have been their their only choice. I think once I decided to do it, that find somebody that could run with the ball. But when they approached me, I said yes, I want to do this. But you know, I'm involved in the FPA. Yeah. My long term goals are to protect the overall project. Mm-hmm. There are other founders involved in the project, and so let me let me go and talk to people and see and make sure that the community is okay with this. Okay. And so I did a round of, of conversations with FPA internal, all three of the original founders, Jurgen Regal, Werner Meyer, and, and York Von Abret, Yeah. and talked with those guys and said, what would you think if there was a commercial company in parallel with this? Yeah. And they're like, go for it. Yeah, this sounds great. <laughs> yeah. Do it. The original license for FreeCAD was chosen specifically to allow commercial activity around the project. Oh, so really? they were, those guys were, yeah, absolutely. Wow. That's why it's not GPL. It's LGPL. Wow. That's super cool. So that must have, that must have been insane to get a message like, especially with all the things that you had done at that point to try and make FreeCAD better to be like, hey, we'd like to give you a ton of money and the ability to hire a bunch of engineers and run this, this very different than what it's been so far, but this big thing that can have a, a sizable impact on FreeCAD as the project and also try and form this commercial entity around it. Oh man, that must have been so exciting. That must have been such a cool thing. Scary to be like, as fuck is what it was. <laughs> <laughs> what, what did it feel like when uh, when the wire hit the bank account and yeah. you knew it was time to go? Yeah, that must have been nuts, huh? No, I, honestly, I, I knew about entrepreneurial financing and startups and so forth. So you see this big number in the account. It never occurred to me. It's like, oh, look, I've got all this money. That never crossed my mind. I looked at that and I went, oh, geez, am I going to be able to do this in two years? Yeah. It's like, <laughs> and you know, what? I think that is- That number doesn't look very big. Yeah. That's the best <laughs> reaction to have if you look at that money. If you look at that money, you're like, ooh, lots of money. That's probably not a great take. Like there's a, I, it's some Dungeons and Dragons podcast, but the guy who runs it says, power should exhaust you. It shouldn't feel good. It should feel draining and stressful. Looking yes. at the money in a bank account like that, it shouldn't make you feel stressed. It's like that is a that's an obligation, that is a responsibility. It's not like woohoo necessarily. I mean, it right. can be both, but yeah. And it it didn't come without strings attached, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, there's investors that expect progress on this and it's like, yeah, it was an insane experience like, you know, all these things you've wanted for so long. You want to find a way to hire engineers. It's mm-hmm. like I got the resources to go hire engineers. Like, let's go get great people and start working on these things that, you know, you just haven't been able to crack for so long. It's, right. Finally, we can do that. That's so cool. But the other, I will say that the other part of this we haven't talked about besides the money was that because of how OCV forms these things, mm-hmm. like day one, you know, and we're right at a year. Uh, this started right after January 1st last year. Cool. Day one, when I went in, I've got an HR person that's helping me set up Glassdoor and get recruiting going. I've really? got a content person because OCD is providing an umbrella to help develop or figure out how to develop content. I've got somebody who's mentoring me because I'm not a CEO. Like I've never done that before mm-hmm. or a CTO. So there, there's all these resources wow. that, to, you know, legal, right? Here's your legal team. 
and you know they've they've already set that up. So it's you know if I've got a legal question, I've got somebody to go to, and it's it's handled. Wow, that's so important. That's so cool. But yeah, our our first like. Six months was like finding a lawyer, finding an accountant, figuring out what HR software, to, like that, that was like a huge thing trying to get all that yeah. stuff squared away early right. on. To just be handed the meta must have been awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like literally, I've not had to worry anything about accounting because it's just, it was, it's done. Oh, Brad, I am, I am <laughs> green with envy, dude. That sounds so nice. <laughs> it's, it, it really has been working with OCD has really been an awesome, awesome experience. You know, not without stress, not by any stretch. Like you said, you know, the power is exhausting, mm -hmm. but it is, I got to say that they've done an outstanding job of providing structure and resources to get us going. Yeah. Wow. That is so cool. Wow. Oh man, that's. That's rad. <laughs> I, I, that's such a cool thing. So Ansel like started out before the company founded. You wanted to make the project better and all that stuff. But now there's a company involved. What is Ansel's specific mission? And I'm sure it's not exactly the same as Freecat because it has different interests. It's a different structure. But like, what is the goal of the company, Ansel? Well, I mean, as a commercial company, its its goal is to make money at some at some level, at least to to be self sustaining and then to pay back its investors. Yeah, but that's not really what you're about. Right. You're, I, I spent quite a bit of time on this between when I agreed to start with OCV and when we actually got going to answer like this question is like, what's your calling? What's your your just cause? Yeah, how are you going to operate? And they also OCV gave me the freedom to choose what legal structure we for formed as. Oh, wow. And so we formed Ansel as a public benefit corporation. Wow. And that's still a for-profit structure, mm -hmm. but it has some protections in there that, you know, make sure that what we're doing is in the long-term interest of the project, the, the greater open source project. Wow. And I, I look at it and say, these days, this, where we're, this point in history, being able to communicate is the single most important thing there is. Mm -hmm. And CAD is another form of communication. You're communicating technical intent about shapes and parts and assemblies and bills of material. And you're doing this to communicate with your vendors so that they can produce it or so that with your collaborator so that he can improve it. Mm. So, you know, taking these tools and locking them up in really high price packages makes it not accessible to people that could, you know, make cool stuff, improve the world, go mm -hmm. do great things. Yeah. So, our goal was to like, let's make these tools more accessible to more people. And then the way to do that is to start focusing on commercial users. Mm -hmm. Like you've got to get the software to the point that it works for companies that are already doing these things yeah. so that you can expose those capabilities to the, uh, the, you know, the startup entrepreneur, the small company, the open hardware project, et cetera. So yeah, yeah that's what we're doing. Cool. That's an interesting way to look at it of like, if you focus first on the commercial users and their interests, like the hobbyists and the home gamer and the open source project, those interests follow after commercial. But if you focus on the commercial too, they are able to communicate exactly what they want very clearly. They will show you with a dollar. So it's a very clean, like, yes, I'm solving the problem or no, I'm not. And it'll help fund the production of the project because they have the money to pay you for some of those right. extra commercial things. So it makes a lot of sense in this way to to kind of focus on commercial use for improving the project as a whole down the line. I can see how there's there's a lot of benefit there. Almost like a trickle yeah, down. And that's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The model we're following is is called open core or buyer based open core. Mm -hmm. And the uh, and the idea with that is that the core project remains free and open source, unchanged. What you build around it is you're building commercial features. Most of what you're building, if it is, improves the life of an end user. That goes back up into the up upstream project, right? Okay. So we're building the assembly workbench. That's going to go into the FreeCAD, core FreeCAD product. Right. We're not going to try to monetize assembly. Right. Then those features that are targeted, say, at the enterprise, the things that make collaboration work, where an, a single individual doesn't really care, but he needs it in order to talk, he needs version control, he needs those are the features that you want to monetize because enterprise needs those to make it go. Right. Yep. So, you know, the analogy with like GitLab is you want to run GitLab as a separate project, you can self-host it. Mm -hmm. But if you want to do an approval cycle on source code or release management or continuous integration, continuous deployment in the cloud, those are the features that you're going to pay for. And that makes everything else happen. Sure. 
Yep. Yeah, that's that's kind of true. It's like I, I it's almost like not, not freemium isn't the right word, but like the commercial customers are paying that extra bit that allows the really good features of the free tier right. stuff, the you know, the, the base stuff for literally everybody else. The people who can not afford to pay help subsidize the development of the thing that everyone gets to benefit from. Because those people have the money and weirder, harder challenges to solve that they'll pay for that extra tier right. thing. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. So it's uh, that the model seems to work. It, you know, then taking that and applying it to us, that's where the real challenge is, is, you mm-hmm. know, which features do you, do you monetize, you know, around free CAD? It, it's turning out to be really hard. <laughs> I will tell you, we're, we're struggling yeah. to, to make this connection because- Taking FreeCAD, you're not going to take FreeCAD in its current state and go into a Fortune 100 company and say, hey, why don't you migrate off of SolidWorks or whatever you're using and yeah. start using this? It's, they, they've got relations with their their suppliers. They've got an entrenched user base with a lot of training. Mm-hmm. They've got all of their models are built in a format. They're not going to migrate off really quickly. Yeah. So, you know, finding a way to connect with commercial users and provide real value early on is is tough. Sure. It is really hard. Yeah. Yeah. My heart goes out to you for how how finding that balance of like, you know, where does the money come from to fund this mostly open source contributing back to an open source project? Like Lucian and I have it much easier with hardware. Like it costs a lot of money and time to compile an open source hardware project. It's effectively free to compile an open software project. So, you know, the source being open is very different than just having the finished thing as it is with software. So it's a very easy thing to say, oh, well, just pay us for the compilation and then you'll have it, right. you know, and and that, that's a really easy way for us to make money, still keep the source open. It's way harder with software. It's way more nuanced to find that mm-hmm. balance. So it's cool seeing that open core ventures is a thing, that structure of what, you know, open core projects are and like that it's worked before, that it's worked for GitLab, you know, and the open source projects are better for it because there's some amount of money going into development back to the core thing. It's really cool. But, you know, it's, you look at so many open source uh, software projects that have made the transition to commercialization. Mm-hmm. Blender is one. Red Hat has done it. Uh, many, many, many of them have done it. But it's almost like everybody manages to do it once and then replicating that model is in, you know, like, who's duplicated what Red Hat did? Yeah. Red Hat did it. They were really successful. But nobody's been able to repeat it. <laughs> and uh, not, not one company, as far as I know, has been able to repeat the Red Hat model. Right. Yeah. And- so it's like we keep reinventing, you know, finding new ways to monetize, build commercially around open source software. It should be more repeatable, but it's hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How has Blender made money from, or are they open core? Like how's their structure? How do they make money? There's the Blender Foundation, and then they're almost like a hybrid. They take donations okay. and corporate donations, and then they hire developers and are working on it. So basically, it goes through the open or through the Blender Foundation. Okay, is is the, the primary, but they're they're pretty well funded now. They have really good relations with some of the larger studios. You know, they they, they do really well in terms of donations. Okay, so it's, donations. Us- it's almost like if the FPA made a ton of money from donations and then was able to hire developers to work on FreeCAD. That's more of the right. structure there. Okay, okay, interesting. Right. Yeah, but only if if the FPA also was more opinionated about the code and the direction of the software. Sure. Yeah. Like I said, we're not. We're more removed from it. Interesting. Okay. So what about like? So this leads perfectly into my next thought here, which is, what can you do with a company that you can't with something like the FPA or popping into the FreeCAD forum and mentioning something like? It, a company is an incredibly, even if it is a public benefit corporation, it's a very different entity than the FPA. It's a very different entity than just like you, Brad, on the forums being a developer for the Pathwork Bench. What benefits have you gotten from also having kind of this new thing in your arsenal for being able to make FreeCAD better, you know, with Onsel, with a company? That's a good question. There's a few things. One of the things that, that I mean, what a company can do really, really effectively is deploy capital. Yeah. For the FPA, you know, okay, we're getting donations in. Now, how do we spend them? Mm-hmm. And you have to take into consideration all these different interests. Like FreeCAD is an incredibly diverse user base. Yeah. A lot of mechanical engineers, but also a lot of architects, right? Yeah. Those are two distinctly different products in yeah. the Autodesk world. Yeah. But they're all in FreeCAD. So, you know, making decisions about how to deploy that that capital is, is hard in an association. 
you're balancing the interests of many, many different users. Mm -hmm. Which user interface? How do you optimize that? People are going to be incredibly opinionated about it, and they're going to be divided because interests are in contention. Mm -hmm. A company, we can just make a decision. Yeah. Right? <laughs> For our distribution, we're going to do it this way. Yep. Right? <laughs> we want to work on this problem. Let's spend some of our money and go work on this problem. Yep. Yep. <laughs> uh, so we can move much faster uh, around certain kinds of decisions. And my hope, my intention is that we can then prove some of these concepts in our distribution of FreeCAD and then take that as evidence back to the project. You should do it this way. Right. Like, here's the evidence. We've seen this work. Here's our code. If you want to include it, merge it, take it, go. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm hoping that there's a, a real good synergy between the open source and the commercial parts of it yeah. that are, we get the best of both worlds. Yeah. That seems to have worked for Debian and like Ubuntu or Linux Mint. Mm -hmm. So it should be able to work here too. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And th this is not as much of a problem that we've had because I started the Loom PMP project and then I started the company. So there was always kind of this, you know, I, I've been the primary force behind the design, at least until Lucian came on for, you know, years. So there wasn't like as much of a community to convince about the company forming thing that was required. But you are founding something on top of an open source project that has existed for, I mean, how long? 15 years, you said or something like FreeCAD's very old. 20. 20 years. Over 20. So like, that's a very, very different. And you're the best person to run Ansel <laughs> for, what? you know, all the involvement that you've had in FreeCAD and like you're as as close to, you know, being the person that should possibly do this as I could imagine. But it still has all the trappings of 20 years of development and con contributions. And like, it's not as clean as, you know, some kid in his apartment that started a project that some people paid attention to. And then a year later was like, I'm going to make a company around this. That was very easy. This is a these are very two different things, you know. Well, really, if you were starting an open core company around software, the, the person that you'd like to have is like the benevolent dictator or the founder of the software project. I'm not that. I came in, you know, much later. Sure. I'm not the strongest programmer out there. I'm not the, you know, I, but I ended up being in this one work badge. So it's, it, it's a balancing act that, you know, Ansel wouldn't, we couldn't survive without the, the open source project. It is absolutely in our vested interest that that project be healthy and vibrant and a lot of development and a lot of people contributing to it. Yeah. You know, if, if, if we start like trying to steer it or control it or something like that, we're dead. It's yeah. just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, you know, there, like I said, there are things that we can do where we have an advantage is, you know, being able to deploy a cloud service is something an open source project really can't pull off. Yeah. So, yeah, I think there's, and, and now it, with CAD getting to the point that collaboration, you know, version control, backup, the the cloud-based approach, and not everybody wants to, you know, be putting their models in the cloud. But those that do, you need that kind of a service. And that's just not something that the, the community is going to be able to do on their own. Yeah. Yeah. To have some, you know, big server managing, that's going to be easier if you have the the capital and the unilateral control of a company to just deploy one of those things, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's that's so cool. I saw in a, a video on I think it was on one of your blog posts about the the new assembly workbench, which looks awesome, by the way. And shortly after, I'm, I want to get into all the 1.0 improvements y'all have been making. But then the little onstool window on the side and you deploy it up and suddenly it's in lens on your guys website. And from FreeCAD, you take a model you had just made, save it, push it up, and then it's shareable and viewable with a link on the Internet. Yep. That's the idea. That blew yep. my mind. That's so cool. And that's that's not something that the home gamer needs to be successful. That's something that would be really handy for a company sharing something. Like, I, I can see where that divide is. And that's something that Opula would pay good money for to have the ability to do that kind of thing. You know, like it, it really tracks. But anyone at home that still wants complete total control of their information and wants to be able to share files... They can email a free CAD file. That that's still totally doable. It's more of like a convenience business thing. I, I think that's really cool. But yeah, I I just saw that the other day, and you know, it, I think it's in line with that. And you know, we, as much as we love free CAD, and as much as I spend all of our time in it, we also recognize that if you're going to put use CAD in your your commercial workflow, that there's going to be parts of your company that need access to those designs, but don't need to be CAD professionals. And so the lens service that we're building has a fully functional FreeCAD instance behind it. So you can deploy a parametric model 
and expose specific parameters that you can change through the website, <laughs> recompute the model, and you know, regenerate what you need, download a, a version of that. So the idea is like, if you've got a parametric design and you want to make it so that people can download a 3D printable thing, but they can change the length or the width or the height or the number of holes in it or something like that, they can do that through the web service. They don't have to even have FreeCAD installed. <laughs> that is insanely cool. This is like the next gen of a uh, customizer yeah, in Thingiverse, except it's not using OpenSCAD. It's using FreeCAD. Like it's got all of right. FreeCAD behind it. And even with how basic OpenSCAD was, you could do so much. So to have FreeCAD behind the engine here, you could do anything. I mean, I, I imagine we have like a, you know, what if there's a, you put in how many unique parts you have in your pick and place job and it generates a strip feeder automatically or a board mount that you can download and print. Like, yeah, that's exactly the kind of thing that large scale company stuff needs, but right. a home gamer doesn't necessarily, you know, or, you know, automatically updating your bills of material or yeah. updating your, the technical drawings yeah. or, or th there's no reason I need to have FreeCAD installed out at my CNC machine. Yeah. <laughs> and if the model changes, I just regenerate the G code and, and pull it down. Sure. I, you know, yeah. that, now that your G code is, is connected to the model itself. And so you, you can now automate the pipeline to get that, you know, so the operator at the machine can just download and run the, and the files ready to go. Sure. So awesome. that's, that's now we can't do all of that now, but that's definitely where we're going. That's that's the whole idea is that there are benefits of putting parts of this into either a cloud or a cloud deployable a Docker container that you run yourself, being able to do that within your workflow. Oh, gosh, that's such a dream. So this leads really nicely into what is Ansel working on right now? Like last I was checking in, it's mostly a free CAD 1.0 release. So what does that look like? What have you guys been working on? Well, there's... Like I said, our, our strategy is first, you got to make FreeCAD acceptable, usable by commercial interest. And that means first focus on the topological naming problem. We got to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. um, you've got to get a, an assembly workbench that does at least basic assembly. And then you've got to get some UI UX improvements because it's just too hard for a new user to get up to the level of being productive with, you know, there's just too many messy pieces to that, to the UI right now. Mm -hmm. So those three it is what the, the FreeCAD project is focusing on, that plus an improved materials capability. Mm -hmm. Like materials is central to CAD. Yeah. You want to say this thing's made out of aluminum, now tell me how much it weighs. Yeah. So there is a materials capability already. It's weak. That's being improved and should be in 1.0, parts of it in 1.0. At the same time, Ansel is getting ready to do our release. Okay. You know, we're, we're not even waiting for 1.0 of FreeCAD. Oh. And it's got the current state of the assembly workbench. It's got a very opinionated set of preferences and mm. themes, so the UI looks much more polished. Yeah, it does. <laughs> We've disabled a lot of the marginally used workbenches so that you just just trying to clean up some of the clutter and make the user experience, especially for a new commercial user, it's like, oh, okay, here's where I go to design a thing. Here's how I build an assembly. Here's how I do a technical drawing. Mm -hmm. Good. That's awesome, Brad. Whenever I use FreeCAD, I find myself thinking like, this platform suggests 20 million ways to do an action and to just streamline it down to what you think is practical, pragmatic, uh, reasonable for the layperson. I think it's just so critical. Yeah. Yeah. And the challenge with that is doing that without creating a hard fork in the project is yeah. the last thing we want to do is, is have a competing, like, that's why I keep referring to what we're building as a flavor or a distribution of FreeCAD. Mm. We're not forking the FreeCAD project. We're not going to change the FreeCAD document. We're not going to break anything. If you build something in Ansel and you open it up in FreeCAD, it's going to work perfect. That's so um, important. Yeah. <laughs> that's, Im that's incredibly important. Yeah. But, you know, where all these choices that you can make and the selections that you can, like, we're also going to be submitting changes that we think should be going into the core and we'll be including those changes in our distribution even before they get merged into the upstream. Right. That's going to be the part that's going to require management to make sure yeah. that we don't create a fork. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that being even just logistically of code management, keeping your opinionated flavor of like, I think the best example that I think of is the part workbench, not park design workbench, but the park workbench should be very, very, very hard to find. Like it, right. it's <laughs> like, I, I remember the first time I opened FreeCAD in like 2013 or something when I was just messing around, I was like, I don't know how to do anything in the part workbench. This is where I think I should be. And it doesn't work. And, and I gave up. And then of course, obviously I came back to it later, but 
you know, hiding that I think has a lot of value in having people stay. So like opinionated things like that, how do you do that in a layer that you can put on top of the main source in a way that doesn't hard fork it? Like, I guess this is more of a technical question, but how do you do that? How, how, how are you going to structure that? It feels like a very difficult thing to manage. Well, fortunately, FreeCAD is very customizable. Mm-hmm. So you have theme packs and preference packs and settings and so forth. Now, what we can do is we can customize an instance of FreeCAD and say, you know, this is, is clean and it, it looks good. And it's, you know, we've made all those choices then take all those choices and roll it into a preference pack and bundle it with our version. I see. You download it and you install and you're running a, a cleaner thing. Okay. The part part design thing, part needs to go away. Yeah. It can't yet. Thank you. <laughs> it can't. <laughs> it can't because there, it is, part is the older, was the, one of the original workbenches that was built. Yeah. It's very, very close to Open Cascade to the geometry kernel underneath. Yeah. There is tools that are in the part workbench that you absolutely have to have. Those need to be migrated into like part design into the appropriate places. And then part needs to sort of quietly disappear. Slip away. Yeah. But we can't do it yet. Yeah. It's uh, one step at a time. The the Boolean tools in part are just so powerful. Like the combined. Right. There's nothing else like it anywhere else in FreeCAD. Right. And if you take those tools and you put them into part design, they would be confusing because part design is working on at a different level of the, it's, you know, it's working on, on bodies and, and sketches and so forth. And, and yeah. so, yeah, it's, yeah, I know, <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's tough. There's no clean way to handle that, but it's cool to see that it's right. not, it's going to be not that difficult to be able to add the Onsdal, Onsdal release of FreeCAD. It's it's not going to be hard to not fork it as long as you you know keep up with the meat of FreeCAD development. That that's cool. I'm glad right. it's going to pan out that way. The other thing that we're doing with the flavor is we're including a a, a set of curated add-ons that go like we're running a bit uh, or just finished running a big study and we looked at what users are doing right now. Almost half of the users that are using FreeCAD in any capacity are also running add-on workbenches or add-on tools. So we're looking at what what are they you know, like sheet metal, like you wouldn't believe the number of people that are running sheet metal. Yeah. Because every commercial CAD out there has a sheet metal capability and sure. we don't have one in the core. Yeah. So like, okay, this is clearly something that needs to be distributed with the flavor. And then, uh, and really we need to start talking about migrating sheet metal into the core product upstream. Yep. So our, our distribution will include a curated set of uh, workbenches that we think should be part of a, a core experience. Yeah. I mean, I I could not, I'm, I'm assuming most people listening to this know this, but everything at Opula is designed in FreeCAD. And I can't imagine us not using it at this point. It's, I, I love it so much, but I could not have designed the Loom PMP feeder without the KiCad Step Up workbench, which is, it automatically imports a PCB from KiCad and brings it in as a as a body as a you know its own first order object in FreeCAD you can even see all the components so when i was trying to see like is this electrolytic capacitor this huge surface metal electrolyt- electrolytic capacitor is it going to collide with the motor i could import the whole thing and and then i could move the component i'm like oh it's not quite right send it back to KiCad there's like full interoperability it's so good so like in my mind that's that's a huge one. I don't know if maybe it should be mainline. And if it is, it's a very long way down the way, I'm sure. But, you know, I, I'm I'm glad that you did that study because so much of what makes FreeCAD useful is the fact that it's expandable and the fact that something like KiCad Step Up exists and we can do that, right. you know? And even if it, uh, something like that workbench isn't suitable to be in the, in the core or the default experience, mm-hmm. it should be like, well, maybe the FPA should be putting money into making sure that this development is is not dependent on one person who's going to get hit by a bus, right? <laughs> and yeah. is also not um, that that the user in experience, the user interface of the add-on is consistent with the rest of FreeCAD. So right. when you install it, everything works the way that it should. Yep, yep. That it translates. Um, you know that the the translation work that we put into core FreeCAD also gets applied to those workbenches so that it works everywhere. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I was yeah. reading some of your blog posts about uh, UX, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. Like, FreeCAD should feel the same no matter where you are in it. And, like, it's possible to follow best practices as a developer by looking at reference material. So just making UX more elevated in the, the project is going to be profound for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. 
and it, that's a hard change though. I mean, Blender has gone through it. You know, GIMP continues to struggle with it. Audacity has managed to pull it off. Yeah. You, you can improve the UI on large projects, but it's not a fast change. No. And it's not a one and done either. No, it's not. It's a constant, it's a constant thing, but yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a tricky one. <laughs> you got your work cut out for you. Also a real quick, could you just describe what topo naming is? What's the topological naming problem for people that don't know? Topological naming problem is it's a problem that's endemic to all CAD and it has to do with if you've got a shape and you want to apply a feature to that shape, mm -hmm. uh, you got a, a cube and you want to put a hole in one face of it. It's how do you attach the sketch or the, the whole feature to the face? Mm -hmm. You have to give a name to the face. Yeah. Well, when it comes to topology, you know, t imagine a cube. It's like, what are the names of the faces on the cube? You call the one top and then you rotate the cube which one's top, right? <laughs> yeah. Or you take a face and you divide it. Now it's two faces. Which one is is face number one? Right. So what happens within FreeCAD is you, uh, you're building up the complexity of the model by, you know, take a shape and then extrude it in third dimension and then select a face and apply a hole and, and you, you build the complexity up over time. But then you jump back earlier and you make a change and the faces become renumbered or renamed and your, your model just broke. Yeah. So this happens in all CAD, but most CAD mitigates it and works around it, keeps track of the names as best that it can. It informs the user if it's broken. It gives the user help in reconstructing it. Mm -hmm. FreeCAD has has had a, a long history where you know we just weren't mitigating it very well. And then a developer, Real Thunder, proposed a solution, kind of forked FreeCAD, had a working solution out there, but the solution is enormous in scope and size, touches almost every part of FreeCAD. And is it, it when you're doing making these changes, it becomes very performance intensive. And so he had all sorts of optimized code in there as well. Yeah. The process of merging his code in and mitigating this across FreeCAD is just a really, really large long-term project. Sure. But we're making progress. That's that's awesome. Yeah. That's and it, like you said, it happens with anything. Like it's just an inherently difficult thing to name these faces and edges. And as you change the assumptions that the CAD software had about a face's name with a previous feature, you, it's impossible to be perfect about that because it's about human intention. Like, do, did right. I want just that one little section of that that edge to be filleted when the edge was split in half? Or did I want both of the resultant halves to be filled? Like, right. it, you just can't, it, it's impossible to know perfectly. But yeah, also a tricky problem. <laughs> That's a yeah, yes. tricky one. And, and, and a, a large Part of it is rightfully is outside the scope of FreeCAD. It comes from the geometry kernel, uh, Open Cascade, mm -hmm. and Open Cascade. You know how faces and edges and verte vertices are are named and numbered is not predictable. It it just comes from the from the kernel. So we have to deal with the naming that the kernel gives us, yeah, and then manage around that to try to match up the user's expectations with the geometry. Oh, I was not aware that that was a component of it. That you're kind of dealing with the API of the of Open Cascade, and you're not no. actually down. At, I see. Interesting. Okay. In fact, like you know, if, if you like hover over a face, it, it tells you this is face four. Yeah. Well, that that string face four doesn't exist in FreeCAD. Like what it is, is it's, it's, it's take, it's saying this is a face and this is the fourth one and computing it at that time. Yeah. So when open cascade renumbers or ne renames them, all the names change. Yeah. Yeah. So e all you can do is work around it, mitigate yeah. it. Yeah. I had a, a question on that. It almost sounds like, uh, the team treats, uh, open cascade as a black box. Does anyone ever talk about solving topo naming as a contribution to that kernel? Like at the higher level, or at least editing the kernel to make it easier to deal with it. Yeah, maybe I, I don't know if you could solve it in Open Cascade, or I, I don't know. Just curious what your thoughts are. I don't think so, because like the, what you pointed out is exactly right. Is a big part of this is what's user intent, mm -hmm. and the geometry kernel doesn't deal with user intent. Right. That's the CAD level stuff. Yeah, Open Cascade is also. I mean, it's the only open source geometry kernel in the world, at least as of now. Yeah, these geometry kernels are really, really complicated pieces of, of software. They take decades to develop. Yeah. And so, yes, we, we do work with the Open Cascade project, but yeah, getting deep changes made is, is very hard. And some of the, the, the politics in the world have affected Open Cascade development. 
Mm. Uh, we've been watching releases and it's slowed down over the last, because so many of the developers were in Russia. Uh, so the Russian-Ukraine the... war has aff actually affected that development. Wow. Yeah. So in many ways, you are kind of forced to treat it like a black box, not only because it is so unbelievably complex <laughs> and it will be easier to probably mitigate in just how you handle the renaming of the faces that are coming out of the kernel API, but it's just, <laughs> it's also hard to, to make that change. Right. Yeah. Mm, interesting. Yeah. And so it's, you know, in, in Open Cascade, it's used in many other CAD uh, applications. Mm -hmm. Um, or CAD-like applications. And so, yeah, we're part of a, a larger community there too. Yeah, yeah. So I want to ask you about the challenges that you've seen with balancing the community and the company. This is something that has been probably the hardest thing for me with starting Opulo and selling a thing with a warranty versus here's some stuff I put on GitHub. And you have a big role in the community. You're really active on the forums. You're well known. You know, you've, you're a huge part of the community. And now you're leading this huge money backed charge. What has been the most challenging part about balancing those two things and making sure that you're doing what you need to as the CTO of this company and also keeping FreeCAD's and the community's interests at heart, not stepping on toes? What, what has that been like for you? What have been the challenges there? Um, Difficult. I mean, a lot. There, there's a lot of challenges there. We can spend, and we do spend, a lot of money doing content. And, you know, like prior to the work that we were doing, FreeCAD had four separate assembly workbench options, all add ons. Yeah. And the number one thing everyone said was there needs to be a single integrated default assembly. But, you know, how does a community agree to that? Yeah. <laughs> right. You get four options, and the, the users are divided amongst them, and the developers are divided amongst them. So rather than try to argue about it on the forum, we do an op, we did a seven part blog post series where we took each of the options and tore it down and analyzed what it would look like to bring it into the core. Yeah. And then a summary of that and then a set of recommendations saying, we think that the best thing to do is that effectively we got to kind of start over, yeah. but we got to borrow ideas from all of these things. And then we have to find a way to make migration of assemblies. If you did an assembly in A3 and you want to bring it into the integrated, that should be possible. Okay. So the, you know, working with the community by like kind of slowing the conversation down and like talking at a different, like we're not just going to go out on the forum and argue about stuff. Yeah. We're going to try to line out a, a set of recommendations that are backed up by some sanity. Right. But even at that, you know, when we do that, we make the decision to start a new assembly workbench. Like there's going to be people that are are upset with that. Mm -hmm. That are, you know, their role in the community or their their influence changes and like yeah, it, it's that's a real challenge. Um the the great thing has been that, you know, the the core maintainers and the the core developers have been incredibly supportive. Yeah. And really helpful, and they want us to succeed. Yeah, and so they're working with us. And you know, I'm just I'm grateful for these people. Yeah, they're just a uh, good. That part of the of the free kit community is just awesome. Yeah. So it it sounds like a lot of communication. Like I mean, I I've been reading for anyone listening that has not read any of the Ansel blog posts. They're wonderful, Brad. When I see Ansel tweets, one of one of the new one comes out. I'm stoked to read it. They're well written. They, they're really interesting to see how y'all are thinking about making these improvements to a big thing with a lot of inertia. They're really great. So I, I, I like the approach of like, hey, cards on the table. This is what we're thinking. Obviously, we need to have an integrated one that's by default so for new users. That's, that's obvious. Here's kind of how we're approaching it and kind of putting it out there in this nice, long form, well-written thing. That's a cool way to be like, not just like try to unilaterally do what you want to do, but be communicative with the community, let people have the discussion and then get enough people on board that you'll, you know, that it'll get merged if you do the work. Right. But, and you know, to, to do anything else means that you're, you know, I mean, there's so much value in, in our user base mm -hmm. being able to tell us what they need and what they want to achieve with the software. But you know, for so many years, almost 20 years, the core FreeCAD community was made up of power users and developers. These were people that knew CAD and also knew how to program. Yeah. And then with the influx of, of refugees, we ended up with a lot of people that know CAD, but they're not software developers. That's not their job. Yeah. It's not their expertise. Mm -hmm. And if we're still running the community like, okay, tell us how to build the software. 
Well, that's the wrong question. Yeah. The, the question is, what do you need the software to do? Mm -hmm. What are you trying to achieve? Then we'll figure out how to do this in a way that works and is efficient. And so it's starting to change how we have the conversation and how we, we tap into this great, unbelievable resource of, of user expertise right? and then turn it into great software. Sure. Yeah. There, there's a great uh, Bill Hader quote, the actor and comedian, where he says, if you write a script and someone reviews your script and they say that there's something wrong with the script, they're almost always right. But when they tell you how to fix it, they're almost always wrong. <laughs> and I think yes. to a degree, this is true. I, I don't think it's universally true, but like if someone says, hey, Stephen, this you need to update this docs page to say this thing. They're right that there's something wrong, but maybe the reason that they think that page needs to be updated is because I failed to let them know another critical piece of information three pages ago. You know what I mean? So like, and it's right. not their responsibility to have the entirety of the project and all the docs and the whole workflow in their head. They're just having an experience, which is inherently valid of like, is it easy or not easy? And then it's my job to be like, how do I solve this problem the best so you don't even notice that this problem was a thing to begin with? So I think about that quote often. And sometimes they're like, hey, you should, you know, add another character in the script. And they're totally dead on right. <laughs> but, you know, right? sometimes they're not. It depends on their experience, you know. But yeah, I think about that right. quote a lot. I think it's a good one. But I, I do the same kind of similar when you start talking about features or UI in, in CAD. Somebody will say, well, you know, Onshape does it this way. Yeah. Yep. It's like, look like. That, that's useful information, mm -hmm. and we should take a look at what they did. Yep. But the really interesting thing is what problem were they trying to solve? Yeah. Because the way they did it works in their model and may not work in ours, right. but if we understand the, the reason, then it leads to a better, a better solution overall. Yes. Oh, I could not agree more. I totally agree. With that. I totally, totally agree with that. So, Brad, a heavy hitter question. What do you, what do you think FreeCAD looks like a decade from now? <laughs> You mean if the if the robots don't kill us all? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Assuming the heat over? death of the universe has been avoided. And that AI <laughs> has left us some work to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, predicting the future is really hard. <laughs> you know, that the the I, I expect that that part of it's gonna be have to do with what you guys do. Um with with how open the hardware does manufacturing really change? Does do we start designing and building things collectively? in a distributed way, right. really take hold. Mm -hmm. And if so, then then we're going to need CAD tools to do that. And that's going to mean services like Lens that you know make that information accessible, mm -hmm. but it's also going to mean new kinds of visualization. Can I get into a VR and connect my VR to FreeCAD so that I can get underneath the car and see how the pieces fit together? Yeah. I completely agree. Long term, I don't, I don't know what the, the user interface looks like or something like that, but I guarantee people are going to want to do more sophisticated design. They're going to want to do more sophisticated assembly, mm -hmm. putting multiple complex things together. And then they're going to do want to do more simulation and analysis of it. Does this hold up to the load? What happens if I, you know, do these parts when they're moving interfere with each other? Right. We start talking about multi-body dynamics. And in commercial CAD, that's a very expensive feature. Yeah. And it tends to be one that's targeted at, you know, a trained mechanical engineer. Yeah. But there's parts of it that apply to a, a hobbyist. Yep. Like I want to make this this mechanism move, and I want it to move in a realistic way. Right. Well, that starts to get into multi-body dynamics, and so developing that is non-trivial. You're, you're not going to get a, a bunch of hobbyists and spit out a multi-body dynamics engine. Yeah. Yeah, that is something that that uh, Ansel can do. That we can start building those kinds of advanced features and making them available to more casual. Everything from the hobbyist to a new entrepreneur to a commercial user. Right. I appreciate that your answer to the question starts with, what do you hope people can use the software for by then? And like, not the feature level. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's yeah. it's the abilities of the software list, not necessarily the, the feature list, you know? Yeah, it's the higher level. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if I could just think it and it would pop out, then I wouldn't <laughs> need a CAD software, but I can't. So you've got to <laughs> capture that user intent right. and you've got to... So, yeah. 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 I was going to say, like, when I look outward in front of me, I see all these objects and every single thing in this built universe has a CAD model associated usually. And it's frustrating that it's inaccessible, like that digital representation of a model. If open CAD softwares were better, they'd probably be more accessible models of things and then <laughs> things would be more repairable. Mm -hmm. For that, FreeCAD is important. It's all hell. Yeah. 
And I would just love to be able to more easily design a, a thing that clips on to an 8020 aluminum extrusion. You know, it should be, somebody's already designed the clippy bit. I just, <laughs> I, I should be able to grab the clippy bit and then put it together with the thing that I want to clip on. Yeah. I shouldn't have to start over. It's almost like feature level design. Yeah. I, I want to put a gusset between in a corner to to reinforce this thing. Mm. I should be able to talk to the software about gussets and it knows what I mean and starts suggesting features. Yeah. Yeah. Like <laughs> it, it like in the part design workbench right now, there's like the hole tool and mm. you can design a hole and that hole can be threaded and it can accept a cap head screw, partially counterboard. Like it understands holes as more than just circles that go all the way through. Yeah. <laughs> we we should have more of that. Yeah. Like more features. That, you know, you talk about user intent. Well, what I mean is I want a thing that reinforces a corner. Right. So I, I would love to see more development in that area. Yeah. Yeah. I'd I, like to do more development in that area. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The the reason that the Lumen PMP and everything that we make is in FreeCAD is when I started designing the Lumen like four years ago, I did it in Fusion because it was just what I had. And in high school, I learned Inventor and I didn't want to run Windows. <laughs> So I was like, Fusion's probably pretty close and it was pretty good. And I used that. But then I ran into the problem of I made the the repo, I, I put out in a repo and I had a Fusion 360 like archive file and people had to like take this file and import it into Fusion. And if I wanted to share the design, I could, but then everyone had to pay for a seat to collaborate on it. And so I was like, do I just export the steps? But that took forever to do it. And I was like, ah, this there really isn't a good clean way for me to like share this with other people and then I saw FreeCAD was the thing and I was like okay let's let's plunk around with this and you know a couple weeks later I was 85 90 percent as good in FreeCAD as I was in Fusion and I was like this is this is the perfect tool for open hardware for so many reasons it is cross-platform so it doesn't matter what operating system you're on you don't have to have a two thousand dollar SolidWorks license to be able to integrate with and contribute for this thing all you need is the crappiest PC you can buy from Goodwill for $200 and a an Ubuntu install. And you can, you can deal with this thing. Like it's, it is as the lowest barrier to entry to access it as possible. So that was super important to me. And then one of the things about FreeCAD that's been just incredible for us is the fact that it's open and the fact that I can pull down a Docker container with FreeCAD in it. We have set up all these tools in GitHub. So when we push FreeCAD files, we have this whole CI CD thing that runs where it will automatically open each FreeCAD file, export an STL of it, and then does a render of the image and it puts it into an automatic bill of materials that we generate. So the fact that it's open means that it's easy to put some Python scripting glue together and make FreeCAD automatically do a bunch of things that makes it easier for distribution for people. It automatically says, hey, you need to print these three of these part, two of this part, and this one is optional. If that's what the open hardware project dictates, like when you can run it in a cloud and you can automate some of these things, it makes it so much better for an open hardware project. I cannot imagine using a different piece of CAD to do an open hardware project at this point. It's just the fact that it's so interoperable and the fact that we can automate so many of the things that are critical for sharing and collaborating on a de hardware design. It's, I don't know what, there's nothing else. And like, and FreeCAD's only getting better. So I, I'm, I'm really excited for FreeCAD for the future of open hardware for those, especially those reasons. And it, you know, like I said, first, like let's focus on, on enterprise users. And it's because what you just talked about that being able to do that scripting when FreeCAD was first formulated, started 20 years ago, the mm -hmm. idea was that every action that the user took would effectively be echoed in the Python console. Yeah. You could do a bunch of work, go into the Python console, grab that code, and you've got a macro that does that thing. Yeah. And then you could edit that code and, and do some more stuff. Sure. And yeah. we've partly gotten away from a lot of that. Like a, all of that stuff is still happening, but it isn't always echoed into the console. So you can you can go and write that, but it's you, you're jumping through some more hoops. Yeah. The thing is, if, if we focus on commercial use and being able to support that kind of automation, mm -hmm. the stuff that you need, that creates the capability that an end user doesn't even necessarily know that he needs. Yeah. You may not need it now, but if you use this long enough, you're going to want to automate some part of it yep. or you're going to want to expand it. Yep. And it's like, that should be core to the design principle for the software. Yeah. 
even though the user doesn't know that they're that that's imp- that important. It's something it's that they'll want there. eventually. <laughs> they're gonna want it eventually. They don't yeah. know what they need. Good software will be the right thing for them. We'll anticipate <laughs> where, well, inevitably what it'll grow into, and they'll be like, "Man, I really wish." I, oh, it has it. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Let me it let me go use it then. And yeah, that's that's the total dream of the thing. Yeah, it being able to do that, and you know, I also think about the lens tool where you know you can customize a part. Tooling around stuff like this is what makes it so great. Thea Flowers, she did uh, Kai Canvas, which is a really, really cool open source project where it renders KiCad source files in browser and you can like view them and all that kind of stuff. I've been using that tool to just share a design from a GitHub. You can literally send it. It's all encoded in the link. It'll like you in the link, you put the GitHub repo and it will automatically render the files that it sees from that GitHub link. So I'm just like, hey, check out this commit of this PCB in a link and it views it in browser, get out of here. Like that kind of shareability is the stuff that makes things. Just yesterday, someone asked me in the Discord, hey, how do I modify my motherboard to do X, Y, Z? And I said, oh, edit this part. And I sent them a link and it doesn't have deep linking yet to components, but she's working on that right now that I could be like, literally remove this part. <laughs> and the link opens a KiCad schematic to that. Specific- Imagine if you could do that in FreeCAD with a, a fillet. It's like, hey, I think we should mm-hmm. make this fill at two millimeters instead yeah. of three. And then it shows up in that. That kind of thing, you can't do that in SolidWorks. You'd have to hope that, that Dassault Systems decides to make this thing. We can make that tool if we want to with FreeCAD. You, Brad, you, I know you're an engine behind making those kinds notes. of things. Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> these are things that that make it so that it's so good for the kind of collaboration. And we, we do everything in Git. We track everything in Git and even PCBs and design. Now, code, of course, is, you know, Git is designed for that, but we found a way to do revision control with binary files using Git LFS and locking. So mm-hmm. we have been successfully doing PCB design and FreeCAD file management with branches, with Git, with a little bit of, you know, every once in a while stuff gets a little wacky, but it's okay. That's, I think, a big thing that's left is making the version control. And Brad, I know you've talked about this a ton. Yep. Version control for things. Ideally, Git based is, is how, what my heart leads to. But, you know, the, something that's good and consistent is so uh-huh. big, I think. I think that's probably one of the biggest things left for true, really, really good open, open hardware project stuff with FreeCAD. Yep. That's come up. I can't tell you how many times. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Again, because we start talking with, with commercial users as everybody's like, we want Git trackability yeah. or we want version control. And you just, you don't get that when you're talking to you know, a single end user. Yeah. The, it, it is tough. That's why you're using Git LFS. Yep. You know, these, these changes are, you make a small change and it changes all the geometry and, you know, these Git repos can grow really, really large if you're not doing that. Yeah. So yeah, it is a project. I can't say we're spending energy on it right now because we're trying to stay alive. Yep. But <laughs> and I think that makes sense. You know, you're working on the stuff that's going to be helpful for making money as a company, which you have to do, and making FreeCAD better. I think those are like it makes sense that those are the first things that y'all are focusing on. You know, right? Yeah. Right. But we want to do this for the long haul, and mm-hmm. so it's like first know where you're going before you start down that road, and that's uh, so. Yes, that those are the features. Yeah. Get trackability, version control, collaboration. Yeah, that's it. Yep, those those are the big boys. <laughs> I'm curious for anyone that is listening to this and wants to help contribute to making FreeCAD better, helping Onsole make FreeCAD better. What is like the biggest community ask from you? How can the general populace and like people help you and FreeCAD like make FreeCAD better? How how can the generally people do that? Well, I put on my capitalist hat, I say, buy my product, you know, (laughs) buy a license. (laughs) That's a valid answer. (laughs) Uh, Beyond that, I mean, it is, I I really believe we're all on this kind of journey at the same time. Like I've said over and over again, I want FreeCAD to be successful. Mm -hmm. And that means it's everything, everything you would do for an open source project. Are you willing to contribute to you willing to contribute code? Are you willing to contribute moderation? Are you willing to edit a wiki page? Are you willing to write content? If you none of those things, you know, donate some money to the FPA so we can mobilize more developers. Yeah. There is no way, there is no way in the world that Ansel can compete against Autodesk or Dassault Systems or any of those. But 
Ansel plus the great free CAD community, plus the, the army of, of volunteers and, and collaborators, we can have an open source alternative that even if it doesn't meet all those needs, having a really, really strong open source alternative keeps those closed source ones honest. Yeah. Give them, give them a competition, give yeah. them a reason to start improving their product, yeah. you know, and not pulling shenanigans, <laughs> <laughs> you know, not pulling the rug out from under their, their free tier offering. Sure. Yeah. You know, if, if people could migrate away and go to Ansel easily, they would be less likely to, you know, nerf the next offering of uh, Fusion. Yeah, totally. And it, it's cool with like something that is open source that has a fiscal side of it, like a, a thing to sell. Like when you buy a, a Lumen from Opulo, you're not helping a company. I mean, you are helping a company make money, but that company's taking all of their R&D efforts to put it back into an open source thing. You know, it's like you're not just buying the thing and helping that company. You're also helping the open source project by buying that license. You know what I mean? Right. Like it's, it's, they're, they're coupled together. And I, I think that's a really cool thing. You know, and, I think it's cool. But you're that, not doing it. You're not doing it for altruism. You're doing it because it's the right way to work. <laughs> ultimately, well, th- it well, produces we're doing a it better for thing. Both reasons. Like I, I, I like the ethos of it being open a lot, but also, yeah, I mean, just like you said, you know, Ansel plus a f- huge army of contributors. It's the same thing with the Lumen. Like it wouldn't be what it is if not for all the contributors saying, Stephen, right. you're a dumbass, yeah. do it differently. Like that, it's only <laughs> as good as it is because of that. You know, that's the only reason. So yeah, for both reasons, I think we do. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we wouldn't be anywhere without it being open. Uh, yeah, it, it would just be, yeah. Yeah, and we see, <laughs> we see companies where they're open and it feels like this immense obligation to remain open and when... We, we think that they're doing it the wrong way if it feels that way. Yeah. And like, to right. be fair, we have spent a lot of time putting a lot of things in place to help make that easier. And it was really hard at first to figure out how to do it. Like, it kind of kicked our butts for a while, but like, we figured out how to do it. And I think that's a lot of what we're trying to do now is share it so that it, it makes it easier for people to see how that works. And I think we're in the, the, the same boat. There's, as a commercial company, you have to capture a certain amount of value. Yeah. And, you know, people are going to, you know, disagree about where that line should be. Yeah. Uh, and that's okay. We can, we can talk about that, mm-hmm. you know, but I, if we're not commercially viable, we're dead and that doesn't do the FreeCAD project any good. Exactly. And if we capture too much value, we harm the upstream project and that doesn't do Ansel any good. Yes. Yeah. So striking the right balance is, is the goal. Yes, exactly. See, it's it's got to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, sometimes the thing that's making the money is also making the biggest leaps forward in the open source design. So if the company dies, a huge chunk of the project dies too, you know? So it's like, it's in the project's best interest to keep a for-profit thing. And it's a weird, it's a weird thing. (laughs) It's such a weird blurry (laughs) line. And like, I think that has been the number one challenge for me in the whole Opulo Lumen PMP dichotomy is finding that blurry line and like identifying it and finding out how to walk that thing has been really tough and nuanced. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not an easy or straightforward thing. Agreed. I, I think FreeCAD can pull ahead of companies like Dassault and Autodesk if they continue to self-sabotage their products. Like, SolidWorks gets shittier every year. Mm-hmm. If you look at their latest version of, like, their cloud-connected 3D experience... Oh, my... It was like a social media it's network laughable. or something? It's yeah. like MySpace had a baby with, like, 2010 CAD. <laughs> like, I don't know how these large billion-dollar companies manage to make their product worse every year. It's all these mid-level managers that think that they have to influence it when like, I think at some point a software product can go into maintenance. Like SolidWorks doesn't need to make well, new features. They need to solve bugs. Yep. Yep. It, it's funny you, you you bring that up because I, I had a conversation with somebody yesterday and this guy clearly very CAD knowledgeable and he had a, a, a hot take on this. <laughs> and he said that these CAD companies it's like the only in- interest that has a vested interest in making their product worse. Yeah. Because if you make the product slightly worse and you slow down the engineer by 5%, you just increased the amount of CAD that they have to buy by 5%. Oh my God. Or 10%. What an evil take. Right? So they, 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 can't, be, they can't be too heavy handed with it. Yeah. But, you know, shitting it up just a little bit, you know, it is 10%, right? It gets a little close to conspiracy theory, but now that you've you've heard it, you'll start seeing it <laughs> yeah. in different <Yes>. places. <laughs> wow, that is a weird take. But yeah, I mean, like, I, I if you think about what Blender has done for modeling in, in the realm that they handle, 
there is no world in which I would consider learning anything other than Blender, as opposed to like Maya or Lucian, you know, better the, the yeah. alternatives. Like what are the other ones? Like you were just talking to me about this last night of like Maya is kind of like whatever now in comparison. Yeah. It's it's just like the, I, I think that Ansel and FreeCAD could 100% be a better offering than something that Autodesk has. I mean, yeah, it's going to take time and, you know, difference in resources and growing over time and stuff like that. But I think it's super possible. It is. And it, one thing that has to happen, though, is is you've got to get it into the educational system. Yeah. The closed source CADs are, you know, they're very strategic about, you know, getting curriculum written and getting free licenses into student hands mm-hmm. and getting classes actually structured. So you're not teaching design principles, you're teaching fusion. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And mm-hmm. now that so a student comes away knowing that tool and only that tool, right. that's got to change before you can really get widespread adoption as well. Sure. Yeah. That's why when I teach CAD, I, I try to be agnostic. It's like, hey, you start with the program sketch tools. Mm-hmm. Here's what constraints are. You'll see them in every program that is relevant. And, <laughs> and here's how you extrude your favorite sketch. Go from there. Where's my coincident constraint in Tinkercad, Lucian? Uh, <laughs> they're working on it. <laughs> FreeCAD is going to become increasingly relevant as these software is just dive bomb into the ground. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You'll catch up, no problem. Yeah, I'm really excited about the future of FreeCAD and the 1.0 release and Ansel's role in that and you leading the charge at Ansel. And like, I am very, very excited for the future of FreeCAD and like open hardware sharing. And I think it's going to be really cool. I'm really looking forward to it. So am I. I'm stoked. Yeah. Like, I'm- <laughs> We're stoked. You're stoked. Yeah, yeah, that's good. My, my goal is to make it feel like the no-brainer obvious thing to be open. Like, you have to feel like a dum-dum to be proprietary in, mm-hmm. like, the tech landscape I want to chase after. Yep. And I think solid, recommendable free CAD is a huge component to that. Yeah, I think it's a huge part. It's an absolutely huge part. I think it's w- w- one of the the, la- the last bastions of it. Be- and, and, you know, in sharing and, you know, stuff like that. I think some of the Git challenges and stuff that we talked about already, but, and then we're in really good shape for it. I want there to be like a default GitHub template that is like open hardware project template. And it has all the CI stuff for automatically sharing a bill of materials, PCBs, you know, 3D models, all that stuff. And it assumes that you're using KiCad and FreeCAD. And then everything else from there is unopinionated. So yeah. whatever you put in there, you can define your structure. It's almost like uh, MK Docs, where there's like one YAML file or, or JSON file or whatever at the, the root directory. And it defines the project structure. And then you tell it, hey, these are the parts. There's a bomb.csv that you tell it what parts you want to export in the bomb. And then it just handles all of the sharing, all of the interoperability, all that stuff just kind of drops out from there. It's like the standard format for sharing an open hardware project. Oh, I I dream of that. I think that would be so cool. Maybe one day they'll be like, download this Docker image and it's all the applications you need to run an open hardware company in the cloud. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like what OpenCore Ventures did for you, Brad. Here's your accounting. Here's your lawyer. You know, it's just everything yeah. all bundled up. <laughs> I think we'll get there. That would be nice. That would be really nice. Yeah. And the trick is doing that and monetizing it, though. I- <laughs> that's that's an exercise left for the reader. Uh-huh. If that comes in a Docker container, everyone would do it. <laughs> All right, Brad, do you have other things that we did not talk about that you really want to discuss or bring up or mention in this that we did not touch on? No, nah, I think we were wide ranging. I think we hit all the all the high points. All the meaty ones? Okay, good. All right, Brad, where can people find you and Ansel on the internet? Ah, we're at Ansel.com. O-N-D-S-E-L. Uh, also at Ansel on Twitter. Um, I think probably all the platforms, <laughs> all the big ones anyway. Or Google us. <laughs> That's also a good solve. <laughs> and there's links in the show notes to all that stuff as well. All right, folks, that's it for this one. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to leave a review wherever you get your podcast. It helps us out a tremendous amount. You can find Opula on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And you can find all of Brad's social media and Ansel's social media in the episode description. Also, don't forget to check out Opula.io and sign up for our newsletter where we write blog posts and do customer interviews with other folks building open hardware. And we'll see you in the next one. See ya. Bye. <laughs> Good. All right, those were the all the little notes that I had. Lucian, do you have other nuggets that we didn't put down on that on that sheet? Um, 
Not really. I had a, a take that was too, I think, too spicy, but. <laughs> well, let's do yeah, it, and Mitchell yeah. will cut it if need be. Go for it.